So I want to start off with a simple question for all of you. How many organs are there in your body right now? You've got a class full of yoga teachers, right? How many organs are in your body? Sorry, how much? 60. Okay, any other guesses? 40, 60. Well, it's interesting, right? We use this instrument every single day and we are not quite sure. I wasn't either, so I asked three doctor friends and they were not sure either. And they're like, oh, it all depends on how you count organ. So I then went to my most trusted source, which is Miss Google, and Miss <laughs> Google told me there are 78 organs in the human body. We're popular consensus, 78. And the largest of which is the? Skin. Skin, exactly, great. Now I'm going to introduce you to the uh, 79th organ in the human body, not created by... God or by nature, but completely by human beings. This little thing here, this has become our 79th organ. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but it is in so many ways like an organ. It has a skin, you touch it, it responds. It has ears, you speak to it, it understands. It's got eyes, it recognizes faces and objects when you hold up against it. It's got a voice, it talks back to you. Not just a memory, an infinite brain, because you seem to be able to ask any question like what is the capital of Burkina Faso? And right there, it tells me Ugadawagu. <laughs> <laughs> and it must have, you know, going beyond that, because somehow this, this little organ seems to be collected to all publicly available human knowledge out there. And clearly it has a mind, body, it is some kind of a spirit and consciousness. Otherwise, otherwise, why else would all of us walk around with this organ so close to our heart? Sleep with it next to our bedside, even in an ashram. And most importantly, go to any city anywhere on the planet these days, you will find people walking around with the 79th organ, lost deeply in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> but and all jokes apart, this has become the most pervasive piece of technology in human history. Last February, we reached a unique inflection point. There are an estimated 7.1 billion human beings on the planet, and there are 7.2 estimated mobile devices on the planet. For the first time in history, we have a piece of technology that has exceeded the number of humans. And that has put us in this very, very unprecedented kind of situation. It has got tremendous amount of uh, benefits that we can see all around. And I'll talk about a couple. But sometimes it also leads us to unanticipated kind of consequences. And I want to start off by telling you a small story of one of these consequences that I saw with these kind of technologies. And it happened about four years ago, I went to attend the largest gathering of human beings anywhere, and it is the Kumbh Mela Festival. And this Kumbh Mela attracts more than 100 million people, the last Kumbh Mela. And I went there because Mirabai Bush said she had gone there. In fact, she met her guru, Neem Karoli Baba, at the Kumbh Mela Festival, among the millions of people. And after that, I started believing it is true that you don't find the guru, the guru finds you, because Neem Karoli Baba found Mirabai Bush among the millions of people. And in India, when we say millions of people, it is not a figure of speech. It means there were actually millions of people gathered on the banks of the river Ganga and Yamuna. So early one morning at the Mahakumbh Mela festival on the banks of the Ganga River, I was walking, and as the sun was coming up, I saw a sadhu, a Hindu holy man. And this festival is very famous for attracting all of the extended family of sadhus and holy men and babas who come down from the Himalayas and other ashrams to congregate at the Kumbh Mela. So early one morning as walking, I saw one particular kind of sadhu. They are called the Naga Babas. They are fiercely ascetic. They have uh, pretty much disavowed everything in their life, including clothing. And I saw this one Naga Baba standing on the banks of the river, and at the festival sometimes they wear a small piece of cotton or something because they are in the midst of a big festival. So I saw this Naga Baba, and early in the morning as the sun was coming up, he was not in a yoga pose. He was not deep in meditation. 
he was not sansin, chanting Sanskrit mantras. Instead, he was jabbering away on his cell phone. <laughs> and I was thinking, what are we doing with all these technologies we're building, what I now call these weapons of mass distraction, <laughs> driving to distraction these professional meditators? But these are the kind of unintended consequences, right? I was wondering, like, who is he talking to so early in the morning? Maybe Lord Shiva, his venture capitalist? <laughs> <laughs> but there are also a huge amount of benefits. And I want to talk, tell again one little story that happened recently in my life about the kind of amazing benefits that you also have with the result of this technology. And for that, I want to take you to a southern Indian state called Kerala to a tiny rice farming village called Chittalamcheri. And Chittalamcheri has got a very soft spot in my heart. It also has got a very special connection to people in the ashram because four miles from that sign, if you walk due west along the rice paddies, you will hit another tiny village called Namara, which is where Swami Vishnu was born. And that was Swami Vishnu's birthplace. And if you continue walking another six miles or so, you'll reach another small village called Kolangot, which is where Krishna Nambudri is from, the priest the, who's in the temple here. So we're all in this tiny rice farming communities. But Chitlanjeri has got a special place in my heart because this is my home village. This is where my mother was born, my grandparents grew up, my sister was born, and this is where I was four weeks ago in Chitlanjeri, right under the same street sign. And I was walking... You know, it was like a roots tour. I was going back, looking at the paddy fields that, I know, a lot of the rice I ate. My grandfather tilled these rice paddies, visiting the village temple, checking out the elephant, looking at the drummers in the village, etc. So it was like a trip going back down memory lane. But I recall when I was growing up, and I would go back and spend the summers with my grandparents, and in this small village, all you'd see is... Uh, Rice cultivation was the only source of income and survival. There were very few telephones. In fact, there were only three telephones for this entire village of 20,000 people back then. And I thought I was a child prodigy because I carried in my head the entire phone book for this village of 20,000 people. I still do. They are two-digit numbers, 31, 32, and 33. <laughs> And in the simple villages where my grandparents grew up as poor rice farmers, that's my maternal grandparents, and this is where my parents also grew up as the children of poor rice farmers with a very modest kind of life, obviously no telephones, but not even electricity, not even running water, and uh, none of the kind of amenities that we are used to. But this time when I went and walked down the uh, in rice paddies of Chitlanjeri, half the village had some form of a mobile device in their hand wearing all their white dhotis or mundos tucked in their little bundles on the side were these devices and it struck me that these villages could pull out these the 79th organ in the hand punch in 16 digits and be instantly connected to any one of you in whatever part of the world you live in all of a sudden we've done this amazing thing that we have put the capability of almost 7 billion people are connected to each other through this little device and that is amazing. And it just doesn't quite stop there. I looked at the village school where my mother studied. And it is very modest. And it still, physically, it still looks not very different from how it was when my mother studied. Except for one difference, one big difference. For kids in that school, and for tens of thousands of schools like that, if they are connected to the internet and using technologies like the kind that we build at Google, these kids have now have same um, access to the same amount of information as somebody who goes to Stanford University or Oxford University. In an era where information is like oxygen, we are leveling the playing field for humanity. And that is fantastic. That is, a, that, is, that is a huge amount of empowerment we've done. So those are the kind of benefits that are coming with all of this technology. But it does come at a certain price, especially for the people in the room who are set on a certain path and the kind of issues that uh, Judith and Mirabai have been talking about. And the kind of problems that it has brought about is simply this. 
Oh, before I get there, I also want to mention that you know the implications of all of it, the benefits of the technology come all the way down to this ashram. Today at dinner, Swami Hridaya suddenly blurted out, said, anytime I have a question, I go to Google and it gives me the answer. And Judith, this tenured professor at Naropa University, blurted out saying, we cannot live without Google. I wish I had recorded that. That would be the next greatest commercial. <laughs> this teacher of meditation and Buddhism saying we cannot live without Google. But I told them that even though we have you know, so much of our life is dependent on this technology, the simple fact is it is still a technology that is only available to a privileged few. Only 2 billion people in this world, roughly 2 to 2.5, have access to these technologies like Internet. So more people actually live, get on with their life without any access to this technology, which, is, you know, which will change. But in the midst of all this, there is one technology that every single human being uses every single day, whether it's a CEO of a Wall Street firm or a tribesman in the Maasai Mara or the, the elephant Mahot in, back in Chitlanjeri. And what is the technology that every single human being has equal access to? Exactly. It is the most sophisticated, most complex technology still known to humankind. Even though we are fascinated with all of these kind of things, our, our brain, our body, our breath, our consciousness continues to be the most fascinating piece, most complex piece of technology. And if you don't believe me, you know, just watch a two-year-old learn language and how they pick up little words and string together sentences without formally being taught grammar. And I know my colleagues back at Google have not even come close to replicating that kind of intelligence in the machines that we're building. So this is the most sophisticated complex technology that is available to every single human being. You know, and it's, this is a representation of a body, a breath, a brain. And what is unique about this technology is that every piece of our life experience is being filtered by this technology. Your entire life experience has to go through this technology. We all ate dinner today. That dinner is being processed by this technology and converted right now to energy and organs. You're paying attention to me and trying to make sense of what I'm saying. This conversation is being processed by your internet, by this technology. Swami Hridaya was playing beautiful kirtan and we closed our eyes and heard and we were transported to a blissful state. But that happened because this technology was instantly processing. It was picking up auditory senses, uh, sensors uh, and, and creating impressions in our brain and somehow it was changing at a cellular level and that we were feeling wonderful. If you walk out at sunrise at the beach tomorrow, again, it is this technology. What visual imprints you get makes you peaceful or makes you agitated. So our entire life, the quality of our life is determined by how things are filtered by this technology. And the quality of our life is a function of how we optimize this technology into a state of peak performance. And I'm purposely using the word technology, it's more than that, just to make this comparison. So even as the world gets enamored with all of these technologies, these weapons of mass distraction, me and my colleagues are putting out, there's no denying the fact that this is what our life experience will go through. And this is why, you know, when I look at what Swami Vishnu had taught me and has continued to teach and his teachings have spread, the simple principles of proper exercise, proper relaxation, proper breathing, proper nutrition, proper diet, as you'd call it, it condenses it down to uh, that simple understanding. So that all of us now clearly understand. But that puts us into a very paradoxical situation in today's modern world. And why is that? Because this technology, when asked to work with this technology, runs into a conflicting situation. Because all of these technologies are constantly clamoring for our attention with their pings and their rings and their tweets. It comes in 24 by 7. They don't understand that it's 3 a.m. in the morning. You need to be sleeping. Status updates keep coming on Saturday morning. And our attention is getting fragmented by the demands placed on all of these technologies, right? And we feel frazzled if we try to respond to it. We can't keep up with it. We're inundated. In contrast to that, 
this technology, especially our mind and brain, seems to periodically need its moments of quiet, moments of rest, moments of relaxation, solitude. And that's why in order to put this technology into peak state of performance, every now and then we have to unplug, in a manner of speaking, from the internet and plug into what I call our inner net. And all of the teachings that you're picking up, TTC, ATTC, is really, you know, primed for that purpose. And the broad topic of mindfulness that is being covered at the symposium that Mirabai talked about yesterday, Judith talked about today, is really, if you distill it down, is designed what wisdom teachers over 2,000 years have figured it out by experimenting with the body and mind, all of these practices, and there is a vast array of them, broadly we call them mindfulness, but any mind, body, spirit practice is really designed to put this technology, the inner net, into a state of peak performance. But the challenge for someone like me in having learned a lot of this during my 30 days fully immersed in a TTC program at the Shivananda Ashram in Naya Dam, and then trying to translate it and explain it to my colleagues at Google, that can be a challenge, right, in a five-minute conversation. So thought about this, and a while ago, I distilled it into a few simple practices. About five practices, and that is what I want to talk about tonight. And this is something, and after you leave the course, you're going out there, you meet a relative friend, cousin, nephew, and you're trying to, distilling it into a few simple five or six practices may get people started on this path to occasionally unplug from all of these technologies, the internet, and plug into the internet, which is essential for all of us to really live fully engaged in this world. So what are those uh, five rituals? The first one I explain to people is simply focus on the essential. Focus on the essential. A German philosopher Goethe said, things that are more important should not be at the mercy of things that are less important. Things that are more important should not be at the mercy of things that are less important. And when you have a few essentials, you can more easily organize your life around them, focus on it. This is why all the masters reduce their great wisdom into a few principles. And how many essentials do you need? Start with one, maybe three, maybe five at most, five. Look at what Swami Vishnu did. He took the entire vast philosophy of yoga, fast roving philosophy of yoga, and reduced it to five principles, right? Proper exercise, proper relaxation, proper breathing, proper nutrition, proper diet, positive thinking and meditation. What did Swami Shivananda do? He took the entire vast array of the Vedanta philosophy and he said, serve, love, give, purify, meditate. And if you do these five, then you realize the sixth thing, right? You attain the goal. So when you have a few essentials, when you know what are the few things that you need to focus on, you can say yes to those things throughout the day and say no to everything else, which is actually a distraction. And that's really one of the core, simple principles of mindfulness. Be, start with knowing what should you be mindful about, what should your attention be focused on, and then everything else is noise, it's distraction, you turn it off, you get rid of the TV, whatever else you have to do. So in my case, I have five. And how did I come up with the five? Uh, several years ago, I was part of the management team of a uh, Silicon Valley startup company. And it was a very stressful period in my life. So to get a little bit of respite, I went and stayed in a monastery in California. It's called the New Camel Dolly Hermitage. It's a Benedictine uh, order. It's a Christian brotherhood. And it's in the Big Sur Coast in California. And it's a group of about 11 monks, very reclusive. They spend most of the time in prayer and meditation and contemplation. And one way by which they make a little bit of income to sustain the monastery for their own livelihood and practice is they have nine cottages where you can go stay as a guest, each guest one cottage, and spend most of the time overlooking the Pacific Ocean in your private meditative contemplative practice. That's what the facility is provided for. It's a small, tiny retreat center, but great for private personal practice. Although what amazed me was that for a bunch of 11 reclusive monks, 
they have a URL for the monastery. It is www.contemplation.com. <laughs> In brilliant marketing, they had captured that URL early on. And I had no idea how they were so savvy about the internet. So anyway, I went and stayed in the monastery. And while I was there and spending a lot of time reflecting, it struck me that my startup company had a business plan. And yet I had no business plan for my own life. And I said, isn't that the most important thing? How come I don't have a business plan for my own life? And I spent my time at the, during that retreat actually writing out a business plan for my life. I didn't call it a business plan. People call it a mission statement. It's like, what is the essential purpose of my life? Why am I here? What am I doing? What should I be spending my time, my energy, my money on? And I didn't want it to be too long, too complex. I wanted it to be fairly simple. So I thought about it and I reduced it to one page. I said I should be able to fit it into one page. It should not be any more complex than that. And I wasn't satisfied with that. I said, why should I even need a page? If Swami Vishnu could reduce it to five things and Swami Shivananda could reduce it to five things, I should be able to get it down to five things. So I actually came up with five words, five words that define what I call the organizing principles of my life. And this was about 16 years ago when I did this. And s ever since, I carry those five words essentially on my fingertips. And the idea being that on a daily basis, weekly basis, I spend most of my time, my attention, my life energy, and my resources on those five things and say no to most other things which I consider as noise, wherever possible. So that is the whole idea of just starting with that essential as you leave your, you know, the program, as you leave the ashram, if you don't already have, establishing a very clear sense of your ultimate life priorities. What are your essentials? And if you can't come up with, just pick up the ones that have already been developed after a lot of thinking by the masters here, and that should serve you well. So you now have your essentials. And then the second ritual I tell people, because unless you know where you're trying to head for, in the simple words, you're, you're constantly losing your way, and these technologies will only make it worse. No, it is, there's a ten temptation at this point to sort of blame it all on the technology and say, oh, these days the kids are like this and they're getting distracted. But I don't think it is the fault of the technology. It is our own discernment that is the problem. And the analogy I ask you to reflect upon is this. Think of fire as this powerful natural force that human beings discovered. So we've had fire for a few million years. It is an extremely useful force of nature. It smelts steel, you can blow glass with it, but if you misuse it, you can burn your finger or you can boil a whole city down. And that is the same case with all of these technologies. And that's why having a few key, key principles and the ability to discern determines whether you're putting it to good use, whether it serves you or you get completely possessed by it. So first more, uh, ritual, that you want to put in your life is focus, know your essentials and focus on the essentials. Write it down. And at some point during the retreat or during a course here, come up with, if you already don't have one, what are the three or five things that you really want to focus on in your life? The second ritual I tell people is something as simple as do one thing at a time. Now, you don't need me to come here and tell you this, right? This is like telling people, oh, if you eat your vegetables and exercise, you will be healthy. <laughs> this is everyday wisdom, this is a truism, and this is your, our grandmothers have been telling us. It is true, except we all go around now pretending that we will be the first generation in history that can actually do multitasking, do something different. So uh, I just saw this on my way here, actually, at the airport. I saw this young woman, and... Some of you may have done this kind of behavior. She was pushing, uh, at the security line, she was pushing her suitcase because her hands were not free. So she's pushing and walking like this because she was chatting on the phone and she had a sandwich in one hand. <laughs> and she's pushing the suitcase. <laughs> Meanwhile, while all this was happening, I think the caller needed a piece of information. And she said, hold on a second. And she cradled this in her hand. She pulled her iPad and started thumbing with one hand while still <laughs> continuing this journey towards the security line. When she got to the desk there, the, the, the officer said, I need to your boarding pass. So she set the, f uh, the iPad down carefully, 
reached into our wall, into our purse, picked up the boarding pass and the driver's license, gave it, then picked up the phone and continued. So at this point, she was doing five things at the same time. <laughs> and I looked at this and said, how did we get here as a civilization? How have we survived as a species? Because through trial and error, the one thing that I figured out is this technology, our brain, is extremely good at doing one thing. You focus on one thing, it seems to perform well. You make it do six, seven different things, it completely falls apart. Now we all know this experientially, we've seen this at different times, and yet we are determined to prove that we'll be the first generation in history to do five things at the same time and be able to successfully deal with it. Really. How would you feel if your heart surgeon was operating upon you and listening to CNBC? Why do you think you see champion athletes focus just on what they're doing you know, in, their, in their athletic endeavor? You'll never see virtuoso musicians practicing and simultaneously watching TV. You know, to get to that level, to move this technology into a state of peak performance one thing at a time seems to be the simple and best formula. And just committing to it, and in, through the mindfulness course, you'll do that. I know this is everyday wisdom, but just defaulting back to that one, the simple piece of advice seems to really make a huge amount of difference. So this is the second ritual I insist on. So how do you bring into practice at a place like Google? We have laptop down meetings. And everyone shut your laptop down. You're not distracted. Just focus on what the conversation is being taking place. So just in, in, in uh, implementing some simple routes. Or I do walking meetings. I ask my colleagues, let's sort of sitting in a meeting room, let's walk and talk. And then you just, you know, you, there's no more technology. There's just two people conversing, and you're being fully present to each other. So figure out what is the way by which you can bring yourself down to this one thing at a time kind of uh, philosophy. And you might even be surprised that there are actually groups of engineers, product designers at Google trying to build that into, say, Gmail, for example, where when you're answering an email, everything else will be taken away and you just focused on one thing. So elements like that we may have to bake into the technology itself just so that people actually incorporate into their life as part of the technology. Crazy as that may sound. <laughs> the next ritual that I tell people is a simple concept of dedicate one minute of your day, just one minute, into something for your internet. And for me, connecting to my internet, there are two practices that are uh, primarily important. One is yoga as an asana practice, and second is meditation. And then during the rest of the time, I listen to a lot of kirtan as well. So I have committed myself to one minute of yoga, one minute of meditation every single day. That should strike you as the most ridiculous, <laughs> pointless idea you ever heard. <laughs> right, you should tell Rukmini, don't bring back speakers like this that come with nonsensical ideas. <laughs> but I'll tell you where I came up with this, why this has had a very, very powerful effect on me and on my colleagues at work. So when I graduated from the TTC, I was 19 years old at the time, and uh, I was the youngest in the class. I might have been the youngest of, at that time probably to have done the TTC as well. When I left after 30 days of this daily practice, I was in tears, tears partially because of leaving the ashram after having such a fantastic time, but also because it was the first time in my life ever I had consistently done the exact same thing. I'd woken up at 5.30, meditated at 6, done my asanas at 8 o'clock, and I'd done that 30 days in a row. There's, n there's no other point in my life where I had that kind of consistency and discipline. The fact that I was even able to accomplish that was a big deal. So I was in uh, tears when I was leaving the ashram, just emotionally uh, charged up by what had happened, and not to mention all of the transformation that had happened in 30 simple days. So when I left the ashram, I made a commitment to myself that I want to hold on to this because I know how I feel now internally, the shifts that have taken place, I want to hold on to this. So my commitment at the time when I was walking down that hill at Nayar Dam in the ashram was every single day I'm going to do one hour of yoga, 30 minutes of meditation for the rest of my life. Now that commitment lasted three days. 
because I was in college at the time, I went back to college and instead of waking up at 5 a.m., as soon as I was back in the dorm, I was staying up till 3 a.m. listening to Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, and Smoking Pot. <laughs> Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> so, you know, my life fell apart back from the peer group, and I continued in years of not having commitment to my practice. And I was struggling with it. I felt there was no integrity. The goal didn't change. So I came, and, and years went by as an adult, I was working in Google along, w and one day I ran into a Googler that uh, Mirabai talked about yesterday with, who actually is the pioneer behind the Search Inside Yourself leadership program. Uh, he's the one who was on the New York Times cover. So I went to Meng his, uh, and told Meng, Meng, I'm struggling with this. I'm not able to meditate on a consistent basis. How do you do it? What do you suggest you do? So Meng, who's a lot wiser than I am, asked me a simple question. He, he gave me a simple suggestion. He said, Gopi, why don't you start with one breath? Because even if you're trying to meditate for a full hour, it's really 600 breaths strung together. You have to get past one breath before you go to the second and the third. So just start with one breath, and that'll be simple enough for you. And since I'm a compulsory neurotic overachiever, I said, I can do a lot better than that. I'm going to do a whole minute. So that's how the commitment to a minute came up. <laughs> and how many minutes are there in a day? Anybody quick who know this or quick math in the head? 1440. 1440, exactly. 1440 minutes in a day. And I said one of those minutes might, I could probably dedicate to my internet. The rest can be completely taken over by other people. So it started with that. But here is something that magically happened. So now, there is not a single day when I could tell myself, I don't have 60 seconds in a day to really nurture my spirit. So every day I would get a brush of my teeth and I would do one minute of yoga. And I've calculated three sun salutations. <laughs> and I would do one minute of meditation. So now what happened was, a week went by, two weeks went by, and for the first time ever in my life, other than when I was at the ashram, I could actually look at myself in the mirror and say, I have done yoga every single day. I have done meditation every single day. Even though it might be just for one simple minute. It doesn't matter. I c I'm traveling, and I'm in a hotel room. I pull out the bath towel, put it on, and get up and start doing my sun salutations. Take the pillow, sit there, meditate, and say, I've meditated, I've done yoga, and now I can go about my business. I've done it in airports. You know, it's one minute, right? But something else magically happened that I was not expecting, and that's where it miraculously opened up doors. On many days, I would sit for just one minute. That was all my commitment. I would meditate for a minute. And at the end of it, my mind itself, my mind can sometimes argue in a good way too, my mind would say, what are you getting up and rushing off to that is more important than this? This is such a sweet, beautiful feeling. You're feeling quiet and serene and still. What are you rushing off to? So I would easily transcend into the second minute and the third minute on many days. I was easily then extending it to 10, 15, 20. And that's how I went back to building up a regular practice. So the idea here is not simply the concept of minute. Find the lowest threshold. If you are struggling with it, find the lowest threshold that you can't say no to for your practice, for connecting with your internet, whatever it may be. It may be yoga, meditation, it may be music, poetry, going for a walk, mindful eating, and uh, Mirabai and Judith have talked about a lot of things. They will continue to talk about it. Whatever be your practice. In fact, when as a teacher, you might have a lot of consistency to your practice, but you will come across colleagues, family members, friends, who will tell you that they're interested, but they're not able to keep it up. And the solution that I've found that works for whatever form of mindfulness that you may choose is Pick the lowest threshold. One minute is simple enough for people to understand. And that's all you start with. Just do, but every single day. The fourth strategy that has uh, served me well and has actually resonated well with my colleagues at work is to commit to make actually appointments for connecting with your internet. The brilliance of Swami Vishnu's model I've seen over the years is back when I did the TTC, and now, 
It doesn't matter where I go to, right? I could be here, I could be at the Shiva in the center in San Francisco, I could be in the Valmoran, I could be in, in, in uh, the Netala Ashram. No matter where you go, six o'clock you meditate. It's an appointment with yourself. Six to six thirty you meditate. Eight to ten you do asanas. And it's the same, no matter where in the world you are, simple system. You, it's, and all seven days a week. Sundays you get up at five thirty and meditate six. Crazy idea, right? <laughs> Sundays. And that's 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 why it works so well when we're in this environment because it is fixed as an appointment on our calendar in our schedule, and you can't move it around. So I decided to embrace a similar kind of strategy in my other life. And how many hours are there in a week? And nearby may know the answer. One hundred and sixty-eight. So the 168 hourly chunk, especially if you're in a corporate environment, much of it gets completely hijacked by someone else because our calendars are available, like my calendar is fully wide open to the 53,000 people who work at Google, and they put things into it. Like, I want to meet you, someone in the Tokyo office, suddenly at 6 you're not meditating because someone says, I want to meet with you, and your calendar gets taken over, right? So often you feel you're helpless, and usually I say, no, I block off time, but sometimes some of these people who put these appointments or as I ca call, two, three pay grades above me, and I don't have the temerity to fight back. So I just quietly take it. But this one strategy I tell people is to take one hour of that 168 hour, put something for your internet to begin with, something around mindfulness, something around your practice to connect with your internet that makes you more mindful, and make that non-negotiable. So the other 167 hours can get hijacked by people, but start with one hour in a week that is your sacred hour, and it's non-negotiable, and you communicate that with everyone else, your family, your colleagues, etc. And you'll be amazed to what extent people will honor it and let you actually do that. But most importantly, you hold yourselves accountable, so you can be a little lack in discipline rest, but that one hour is non-negotiable. So in my own case, I have about three of those kind of unmovable blocks in my calendar, and I'll we'll talk about one of them. Every Monday at 5.30, every Monday at 5.30, I teach yoga at Google. And this is part of the program that Rukmini said I initiated. It's a yoga program for the Googlers. It's called Yoglers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and every Monday at 5.30, I teach. I've joined the company nine, year, nine and a half years ago. I have not missed a single class to date. In the nine, that is the only thing I've stuck to it for all these years. It is my one thing I refuse to let go. So this people have tried to, again, they'll try to hijack it and beat it out of me and throw meetings over it. I said, no, I won't meet with customers, so I don't care what the meeting is. I will teach yoga and then join the meeting. And I've been able to hold on to it because that is my one non-negotiable appointment. So if you're having a trouble with this, or if somebody you're talking to, one of your students has asked them if they can do yoga meditation every single day, maybe once a week, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, or, uh, or Friday evening, 5 p.m., whatever it is to put one fixed thing in the calendar, it has to be on the same day of the week, that seems to work. Again, the Swami Vishnu model, because you're not thinking like Sunday is the meditation at 7, because Monday it's at 6. No, it is 6 o'clock every single day. So you don't even have to think about it. And most importantly, in your own life or the people you're telling about, talking about, say it is absolutely non-negotiable. Start with one, and then you can add other items to the calendar. The fifth ritual that I want to talk about is this notion of start with friend yourself. So here again, in the day of modern day technology, social media, etc., we are all extremely proud of how many connections that we have. The fact that 3,000 people follow us on Twitter, or 21,000 people follow me on Google+, and I have 400 friends on Facebook. We're all extremely proud about that. And no doubt that thanks to all of the social media technology, we are now able to connect with hundreds of, not thousands of people around the world on a scale that was not possible before. Even though it might be inundating us with a lot of unnecessary information, most of the time it is 
establishing moral superiority over someone else because look how great is their life <laughs> compared to mine. No, but all told, in a friend, you know, all this social networks and friending is really great. But I tell people, start you know, on the path of mindfulness, start with the simple first step of friending yourself first. Because on this path, very quickly we realize the most important relationship, in order to you know, find that pathway to the divine, the most important relationship we have to establish is the one with ourselves, through a body, through a mind, through a brain. And therefore, it becomes extremely important to listen to the tweet from your heartbeat <laughs> that... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or the chat request from your brain or the status update from your body because there is an important signal there and if you ignore that signal, then things may crumble in your life. So starting with the simple idea of friending yourself is the fifth ritual. And that is simply saying it is okay in a good way to put yourself first and forming that inner relationship. Because unless this relationship is really solid with your internet, with your technology, you can't really go out into the world and be of service to others in a great way. And it's not narcissistic. It is simply just the first principles of mindfulness to know what's going on, you know, what is going on in your heart, what's going on in your brain, what's going on in your body, what is the quality of your mind? What is the clarity in your mind? And paying attention to that. So pulling together all of these uh, rituals. Now these were just five rituals that over time seemed to have worked well for me and I've put into practice and framed it in a simple way. And I, I framed it in the context of technology because that is the world I live in, living and working at Google and in Silicon Valley. I had to come up with a language and a framework and a metaphor that my colleagues will easily understand. These are not Shivananda students, remember that, right? These are like engineers walking around, some with a very rational Cartesian kind of uh, thinking. And framing it in this kind of context, saying this is a technology along with uh, this outer technology seems to resonate with them. And that's how uh, I've spoken the language of yoga and meditation and mindfulness. But these are just five rituals I came up with. You, and I would urge you when you, because as you, take your work outside in the world, those of you especially who are teachers, you will run across populations that might not have the kind of frame of reference that people in this room have. So you will have to give them certain simple rituals or frame it in a language that they can easily translate to. And this is actually the reason why Mirabai Search Inside Yourself program works so well in a place like Google. And for to begin with, the branding was brilliant. In a search company, you go in and say, here's a training program called Search Inside Yourself, like friend yourself at Facebook, right? Search Inside Yourself. And they didn't call the program. It's going to be a program that is very spiritual and get you to a path of self-realization and uh, connect you with God. No, they, they, they framed it completely differently. Initially, it was called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And Mirabai was saying, people didn't sign up for it. Why? It was considered, if you have a problem like stress and needs to reduce stress, then you go to this course. Instead, they rebranded, remarketed, saying, this is a way by which you increase your emotional intelligence. And the sign-ups actually went through the roof. In fact, right now, among all of the training programs offered at Google, all of the training programs, artificial intelligence, machine learning, C++, et cetera, Ruby on Rails, Search Inside Yourself is the most oversubscribed training program. Why? Because the very clever, young, ambitious techies at Google see it as a way of increasing their intelligence. They already know they're very intelligent, but this course says, you know, you can increase your emotional intelligence. <laughs> so again, it's all a question of framing and taking it to that particular audience that may appeal to you. So I talked of these five rituals as a way by which I taught, I took and packaged what the TTC had taught me and my own practice over the years and my own struggles with actually staying to the principle started with that. I wasn't having an easy time after graduating. It was fairly easy to follow. I just followed orders and showed up when the Swami told me to. But back at home when I was responsible for my own life, it, things seemed to fall apart. So these five rituals actually then got me back on the wagon and this is how I try to teach my students and uh, at, at Google. So you don't need to be confined to these five. You can take up these five or come up with another five that work for you. 
but make them your own, whatever it is. Or you might use a different kind of language. But I didn't stop with that five. I actually wrote an entire book about it, and that's this book that uh, Rukmini was talking about, the internet to internet, where I continue to explore other aspects of this. I talk about karma yoga a little bit here. I talk about just a simple way by which you can, it's a chapter called Practical Vegetarian, where I tell people who are busy execs, who are traveling around, mm, I can't, they're not going to read a whole book on vegetarian eating, but a simple five step process by which you can do it. A lot of things like that I talk about here, right? So this is how I codified and continue to do it. But coming back again uh, to the main topic, then a wrap up. What you will learn this week if you're here for a week's vacation, what you will learn if you're for a month's TTC or those of your advanced student is tremendous amount of uh, wisdom. And it's really wisdom that other great teachers, masters have studied over a long period of time, experimenting with just the body and mind. Remember, all of these are scientists in their own right. But unfortunately, they didn't have the kind of modern equipment that, say, Richard Davidson has at the University of Wisconsin as a neuroscientist trying to understand the benefits of meditation. Swami Shivananda didn't have it. The Buddha didn't have it. All they could figure out was, I sit and I breathe through one nostril and breathe out through the other nostril. All of a sudden, I seem to feel a little better. The problem is less stressful. But they just kept trying it. And empirical evidence, they assembled it and have distilled it into this large body of wisdom. And we're learning a tremendous amount in a very short period. And further, what you know, Swami Vishnu did was package it in a form that you would get in 30 days. Our challenge is going to be, as we step out into the external world, the external world is not quite organized like how life in an ashram is. And here they turn off the Wi-Fi <laughs> during satsang time. <laughs> They don't do it at Google, right? <laughs> you know, the things keep coming at you. So that's why you then adopt it to a set of practices, rituals, and have the discernment in your own life. How will you thrive in the world? So the intent is it's not practical for everyone to retreat into a monastic environment, into a cave. Most of us will thrust ourselves back into a busy, fast-moving world. And it's only going to get faster and busier and more intense with more kind of technologies uh, being built, unfortunately, by not unfortunately by <laughs> me and my colleagues, like things like this or Google Glass, right? So it's the problem is not with these technologies, with the way the internet is coming at you. The issue is going to be your own relationship to it. So that is really the core message that I have in my talk from the internet to the internet. Those technologies that is being built and deployed by these brilliant people are extremely useful, and actually, it is great in terms of empowering people and creating a wonderful platform for equal access to information, social justice, etc. But just like I mentioned the analogy of fire, we have to ask ourselves what is our relationship going to be that will either impede or support our spiritual practice around the theme and field of yoga. And I found the best way to protect it, to continue these practices out is to ritualize it in some way. So it becomes like brushing your teeth. You c there is no day or no you know, week when you can go by without doing it because it is just built into your internal system. And start with some sort of a simple rituals like the five principles I talked about that works for you and then transmit it to your students, to the people who want to learn from you. And we've got four more sessions in the symposium and during the time, I, we will explore more of these kind of topics. It's at 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock tomorrow, day after. I'll be doing some, Mirabai, some, and uh, Judith will be doing some. And the final day, we'll finish up with a uh, panel. I want to end by actually a uh, simple gratitude exercise. That's one of the things I talked about. And that itself can be an extremely great way to connect to your internet. So I do it in my, I started bringing this into the workplace. So I start team meetings, sometimes with meditation. I make the whole team meditate. And uh, in terms of yoga, I decided to push the boundaries. And as Rukmini was mentioning, not only did we, did we bring it into, into Google just as a class. Two years ago, we challenged ourselves to see how far we could push the boundary. And we actually made 11,600 people in one room 
do a few minutes of yoga, mostly it had to be standing poses because they're all not on mats, etc., and set a record for the largest yoga class in America and the third largest in, uh, in the world. And this was in Vegas, the most unconscious of places. <laughs> this is at Google's annual business conference where there were 11,600 people from practically every country in the world. They'd come from Russia and Brazil. And, and the reason I mention this example is there is no limits to what you can do with the learnings that come from here. So when I graduated, and Swami Mahadevananda, who run, was the director of the uh, Nayadam Ashram, and uh, Swami Vishnu and the other Swamis who were there, you know, told us as students, he said, the reason that Swami Vishnu came up with this is first to transform yourselves and then go teach to other people and transform them. Every person you touch, it'll change. And for him, it was a way of bringing peace because he knew, like the Dalai Lama says, you can only have outer peace when you have inner peace. And this path is one way by which you can get there. So he had told us to go teach it to as many people. Who knew? I had no idea that it would travel all the way, because this I was learning India. I'd never left the shores of India at the time, that I would one day end up in the United States, not only that end up in a company like Google, one of the iconic companies of our time, and be able to convince somebody somewhere that I should read a loom, room full of 11,600 employees through a yoga meditation course, and we ended with one giant Om chant in a corporate setting. You know, the whole room chanted home. It wasn't that on my stage was Larry Page, the CEO of Google, and Susan Wojcicki, the CEO of YouTube. So what I'm really saying is there is no limits to what you can do with your teaching, how far you can take it and spread. Just trust that there is some larger force than ourselves that will flow through us in the right moment and open up these doors as long as you're prepared to then take it out there. So I want to finish up with the final exercise. Like I said, a simple exercise that actually make my team do, even if they don't follow these rituals. I tell them to simply practice gratitude. And we're going to do that, and I'm going to finish up with that. So uh, we go around the, around the room in meetings, and I ask every single person in the room, what are you grateful for today? And just by shifting your focus on something you're grateful for, that brings an element of mindfulness. It brings your attention to things that are working in your life. So. Simple practice, and you can do it silently. What is one thing you're grateful for in your life today? What is one person in your life that you're grateful for? And what is one thing in your personal life in general, in your practice, and the one thing coming from yourself as a human that you're grateful for? Thank you for following me. And I'll end up with my own final gratitude exercise and, uh, and uh, expression. And that is, years ago again, when I ran away from my home to the Nayadam ashram, I told my parents, I fought with them, I asked for some money because I had to go register for the course. Uh, I paid only 300 rupees because Swami Vishnu refused to. Uh, he, he told, no way, you can charge anything. That is nothing. Like in today's dollars, it's uh, uh, it's... Twenty dollars, yeah, uh, and that's all it cost. And even in, the, in conversion terms, it. But what I received was this tremendous wealth of knowledge, and I don't know what got into my head that made me want to go and become a TTC at that point. Because remember, back then yoga was only taught by older, bearded Indian men in orange, in an ashram setting. The Lululemon draped yoga studio said not yet happened. <laughs> Wasn't the lifestyle then. So you had to be really a nut job to want to go do yoga. I was ridiculed endlessly by my high school classmates. But I did. And it, what I walked away with this tremendous wealth for the rest of my life that has really not just transformed me, but has become like this fundamental pivot in my life. Yoga and meditation are the two pillars around which. And without that, I am sure I would have been dead long ago. My life would not have functioned. And I can't tell how grateful I am for this entire set of teenagers, the lineages, for what it's done to my life and through me what I've been able to pass on to others. And that's why when I showed that picture, when I was sent, this is what I was thinking. Yesterday I was walking in on the boat, I was telling Omkar and uh, Sam, and I showed them the picture of me standing in this Chitlanjeri rice fields, and I said, I cannot imagine 
that a simple village, a back then, this is a man born in what, 40s or something? I mean, you're in her 30s, right, Swami Vishnu? In such a simple, 47? 27, even earlier, 1920s, in that rural village where almost nothing existed, had the vision for someone from that background to imagine something like this and has gone on to create uh, a platform that has allowed this to happen for all of us to participate in, for how it is transformed. And that tonight, that is going to be my biggest expression of uh, gratitude. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.